Yeah, so Matthew talked um, about Burning Man and how influential it was to him in terms of the art. And, uh, you know, I have a very similar story. Uh, my wife and I, we met at Burning Man seven years ago, coming up on eight, I think. And um, who knows what Burning Man is? Just so I can understand. Who doesn't know what Burning Man is? One person. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Maybe at dinner we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> takes a little longer than that, right? And, uh, you know, here we're, we're talking about a lot of truth and we're talking about a lot of morals, you know, and the other big one is beauty. You know, in a sense, everything, um, all of our human endeavors, in a sense, can be uh, fit into the categories of science, psychology, and art. And art has taken a big place in my life over the last several years. Um, after discovering um, this kind of uh, area of art at Burning Man and then getting to know a lot of these artists, um, collecting their art and getting to know them as people, um, I've realized that uh, the artists have a lot to teach us. Like we can really learn a lot from the artists because they have a, a whole different way of um, interfacing with reality and with culture. And in a lot of ways, it's uh, the artist's job to stand outside of culture and reflect back what we need to see and interpret what's happening for us um, so that we can make sense of uh, the change that's, uh, that's going around. Um, Picasso had a great quote. He said, art is a lie that tells the truth. Right? I really like that one. Um, I also, I think of art as, you know, in my own way now, as being really, it's almost a, like a, a purified expression. It's like expression itself made pure. And uh, by engaging with art and with artists, I think we can begin to understand how to be more elegant in our lives, um, how to communicate and how to think and how to be in ways that are more beautiful, um, more interesting, more attractive. Another thing we'll, you, we'll be seeing here is uh, mostly uh, single, what I would call single frame you know, images, one, one picture. And uh, I, I actually find that one frame for me now is a lot more interesting on average than, say, a movie, right? How many, how many f individual frames are in a movie, right? A two-hour movie has something like 175,000 of these. And these artists can tell a more compelling story to me in one frame, right, than most can in 175,000. And so there's something there about uh, data compression and uh, the efficient use of space and attention um, that I find extremely interesting. And uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I really have, I've gotten more from contemplating art and uh, some of the art you'll see here um, than from, you know, the movies that I've watched from all the kind of media and things. So what we're gonna do is, um, as I mentioned, I'm gonna have each of these uh, artists just introduce themselves, just give you a minute or two about who they are and uh, where they come from. And what I'll do is I'll show an image from each of their uh, kind of collections while they're talking. Okay, so Hans, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself. And this is one of Hans's uh, paintings. Um, yeah, my name is Hans Valor. Um, I'm originally from Colorado. And uh, yeah, I started out in architecture, actually. And um, I was got my degree in that. And art was always a passion ever since I was a little kid. And um, over the last 10 years, I've been in Los Angeles, California, and uh, started out in architecture there and just gravitated back towards my painting and drawing. And I've been doing that um, pretty seriously for the past five or six years. And this is a piece called Hearts Colors, Set the Mind Free. And yeah, I was brought, actually my whole introduction to New Frontiers is through Evan and um, just getting to know him over the last couple of years and the introduction to Matthew and yeah, now I'm, now I'm here. Hello, my name is Sapora and I am a photographer, also work with video a bit, but um, photography, still photos are definitely my, my strong point. Um, this is a little girl in India who I had a really sweet connection with 
I think that's what that, this image is showing is um, my connection with her. Um, and I've been intrigued by photography for as long as I can remember. I think even as a young girl, I would, I didn't have very many photos of myself as a younger version of myself, but the few that, that existed were completely fascinating to me. I would pull my mom's photo albums off the shelf and I just, I had, I think I had this sense even as a really young girl that the photo could reveal something to me about myself that I couldn't see from the inside. There's sort of that, that magic in it um, and I've, I don't feel like I've ever lost that sense about photos. There's just something really spectacular about them. So that's what I'm here. Um, I've, I'm very fortunate to have made my living now for about nine years um, in the business of archiving light. Um, that's what photography really is, you know, writing with light. And so I get to have this beautiful love affair with that language. And uh, I guess I'm still learning how to be fluent in it. Hi, my name is Michael Devine, and I am a painter. I'm an artist, um, primarily a painter. I dabble in a lot of things. Uh, I've been painting for about 20 years, and I left school to go paint and follow my heart, and really just taught myself most of it through trial and error, and I think much of my life has been trial and error and learning a lot, and pushing those errors and those trials to their most beautiful thing possible because what I want out of it and what I want out of art and life is to create that most beautiful thing and this painting is the glass onion which is a painting I made out of that, that kind of pushing through the layers and boundaries and trying to you know find something real sometimes and you know the trick is there's no onion and there's no glass or anything it's all just there um, and that's that's my path in the world my name is uh, Andrew. I go by Android Jones, and uh, I fell in love with art when I was around five years old, and I just never found anything else that so captivated me or took up my whole attention that I decided to dedicate my life towards it. Um, I'm, uh, I had a, a background in traditional academic drawing and painting, and over the years I've transitioned into a, a more of a digital artist using, uh, I love tools, and I love using electricity and technology and really to create experiences and um, whether it's these large gallery installations um, like Matthew and, and Eben had experienced at Burning Man or immersive three-dimensional like 360 dome shows and virtual reality whatever um, however I can use the uh, I can find a way of, of leveraging an excuse for me to have the experience of being creative and finding an output that gives meaning and value for other people and gives them an experience is where I try to spend the majority of my time and my attention um, and my life. And uh, this piece, this is called a Rainbow uh, Geisha. Yeah. So we're here talking about story. Um, we're here in a new frontier at New Frontiers. And I think that art has a um, it's a unique voice uh, for story, whether it's a musical art or whether it's a visual art or whether it's dance or any one of a you know a whole bunch of emerging modalities of uh, transmitting you know what's in here and here to other human beings. And so I've talked to each of these artists over the last couple of days, over the last few days, about how they transmit story through their medium. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna have a little conversation here with each of them. And, um, you know, we've, we've had conversations about this conversation, okay? So we've done a little bit of preparation um, because we really wanna get across like what it is that each of these artists brings uniquely and how they tell their story through their craft. Um, so Hans, um, you know, in our conversations um, a few different times now, we've talked about how you are, um, you're basically listening and telling your story at the same time, you know? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think about making a piece of art and how the story 
you know, is coming through you and through it? Yeah. Um, I mean, first off, I think that I'm basically, to summarize everything, just a reflection. And I mean, I know that's really simple, and uh, but it, it's the truth behind all of it. And I really find that, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of going from a macro scale to a micro scale all the time and back and forth. And I have so many amazing, influential, uh, inspiring people around me in all different walks of life, and especially in the arts within, um, yeah, just within design, fashion, architecture, film, music. So many people that are so heavily involved in different design fields and just people that are involved in like interpersonal work that um, I feel like have like a really good grasp on um, just so many aspects that they can educate me on and, and things that um, just inspire me um, by just reflecting upon um, the patterns that I see and the patterns that I, I, I find within myself and within the people around me. And um, yeah, just uh, kind of finding uh, those patterns that, that I can reflect and, and incorporate into the artwork. And um, I, I was also supposed to kind of chime in here about the idea of keeping things current, mm. right? In other words, staying in tune with that yeah. was the other piece. Yeah, I think that as far as keeping things current with myself, um, I guess it goes back to just paying attention to what's happening at large in, like a, in a broader sense in like the collective consciousness of the design fields. Um, what a lot of different people are resonating with, like what, what kind of, like I, again, what I said, patterns that I continuously see. And I think that design trends and, and interest of, of the masses always tend to shift. And I think that if you're not paying attention to how life is shifting and, and the, the things that you see people finding interest in at large, then I think that you run the risk of, of becoming like passed over or uh, people just get tired of seeing um, you know, something that they've seen before. And so I think it's always a challenge as an artist to, to really pay attention to what's going on uh, with so many of the people around you. And like I said, you know, I'm so inspired by photography and film and fashion and graphic design and uh, even web design, digital media. Um, I think that all of these people have such a a unique look at the design world uh, from their own perspectives and um, yeah just getting a, a good uh, kind of overall view of that and then taking that and you know reinterpreting reinterpreting that into like my own view and my own kind of reflection of, of what I see and I think that you know that in a sense keeps it current. I think that that in a sense keeps it as a reflection of what I see the masses going through and what they might resonate with. So, you know, I think some artists just do the art for just themselves. I find that it really works for me to have that story and message that's a reflection of, of a general macro view that I have taken back into a micro view and then reinterpreted. Um, and I think there's also a really odd kind of collective consciousness in the design world where I'll come up with some concept that I think is original and I'll find someone on the other side of the world that has like a similar concept and I'm like how the hell did they like you know I know that some of it is spread through digital media but it's something that I've never even posted before and so I think that there's on a collective level there's these uh, different um, energies that are that are felt and I think it's fascinating and yeah, just running with that that um, that feeling. I, would, I don't want to say like running with the herd, but running with the design herd and running with the 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 people that are leading that edge in design fields and whatever design field they're in, and just reflecting off of each other. So I think that's what I strive to do to stay current. Yeah, thank you, um, Zippy. Um, Zipporah. That's okay. Zippy's fine. Zipporah, it's okay. I met her as Zippy, and I just, I'm practicing. So how do you tell story through your craft of photography? It's interesting. I've been um, pondering this, and I realized that um, for a long time, I've liked to say that I've spent my lifetime 
telling stories through my various crafts, and of, of which photography is just one. Um, and something wasn't really sitting right with that me, for me, and like the, over the last 24 hours as I've really been feeling into this. And it just kind of came to me just like half an hour ago that um, I think what I'm really aiming for now at this point um, in my relationship with the craft is uh, to go really beyond storytelling to, uh, I feel like I'm a story clarifier because stories are so multi-layered and um, I think that if there's one thing I can see in my work at this point is that I'm, um, I am attracted to, to moments that are, that are um, moments of connection, really. Um, connection in very various different ways, connection between people, connection to, you know, between a, a painter and his paintbrush. And, and um, there's a silence there, there's a quiet, and um, the best images that I, that I am able to offer are ones that come when the subjects, and I, I tend to be more of a portrait photographer even if that's a dewdrop, but really people are, are uh, my strength, at seeing that. But the best photos are the ones where they have no idea that I'm there. So really removing myself from the equation as much as possible, um, trying not to inter intervene or interrupt or affect it in any way. And I think that also comes from a, a deep uh, fascination with cult cultural anthropology that's very deeply rooted in me, just observing people and the way we interact and um, I think there's something in that is that I'm, I'm really listening deeply with my eyes and observing it and really trying to respond when there is an invitation um, and not to go searching for something and, and being too technical about it, but really letting something else inform. And in that, there is a clarification. It's almost that I, because they don't know that I'm there, I'm able to transcend or go beyond their projected story of who they are or how they're connecting with somebody. As soon as you see a camera, I think we all have had this experience, we, we have so many stories about how we look or how we're going to be perceived and so many fears. And so I think really what I'm, what I'm trying to do and really try to maintain an integrity with is um, I, I'm, I'm looking for moments of really pristine authenticity where people forget when they're in that moment of such connection that they forget all about their stories. And I think it's also why I love with children, they haven't yet crafted these storylines of worth and, and the fears of judgment or how they're gonna be perceived. And I think it's why I really, really love photographing children. And, and you'll see much more photos from me of children where they are actually looking and really engaged with me because I can go there with them and they don't change. So I really, um, I'm grateful for the question that, that I've just gotten so much just in the last 24 hours of understanding, clarifying for me what it is that I'm actually doing. And I, I like this shift now. I like to think of myself as a story clarifier. Thank you. So Michael, um, something's interesting about your uh, your method and your approach is these pieces often include, maybe not totally, but they include the story of, you know, some development that you've made yourself. Can you maybe talk about your approach to mapping your own development through your painting? Sure. <clears throat> um, I think where I begin in making a piece is looking at the emotive content before the thing. And um, in doing so, I'm looking at the feeling, the movement, the momentum, just what that experience is. And so if I'm going to sit down and make a painting, I'm thinking about what's inspiring it, sure, but, but it's going to push me into that space. And I'm going to go strike out and explore that for a while. Um, and sometimes it's kind of challenging because um, it might be something that's actually really dark and I know I'm going to have to be working on this big dark painting for three or four months on my easel and that's almost frightening. In fact, it's generally frightening any time that I'm like, okay, now I've got six months to meditate on this thing. 
and I'm going to feel it and think about it and eat with it and sleep with it every day and wake up looking at it, thinking it's coming from that place. And as long as it's coming from that place, you know, it's not trying to be a thing. And I have to get rid of, like, the feelings of, like, what I'm going to do with it and will people like it, which is every artist's fear regardless. Will, will they like it? Um, but just get into the emotive quality so that that story is everything that's happening in front of it. It's everything I'm going through along the way. It's, it's my life. And, and I have a pretty just average life. It's just a life going on like everybody else's life. And, and I have this whole great big sort of space to go explore in it sometimes. And what I hope is that I can bring something back that's valuable for people to map out that emotional content because we all have all of these emotions in us. We have joy and grief and sadness and happiness, and we all experience them. And we have a thousand stories around how we experience them, but they're all very similar of the emotional content. And I find that there's sort of archetypal experiences around it. So I have shapes and patterns and things that all fit together that create just experiences, you know, and that's what I'm hoping to to ultimately end up with and push it to that most beautiful, exuberant, no, exuberant's not the right word, just the most beautiful place. Because it could be tragic and beautiful. It can be happy and beautiful. It's just, you know, the tree is just beautiful. It's just out there doing its thing. And and in bringing that to the world, it sort of softens the, the barriers between us because we can look at each other and say, yeah, I, I know that feeling. I've been there and I've had that from all kinds of different people, whether it's like little old lady or like big dudes who I'm like, wow, I probably would not be hanging out with this big dude, but he's like, that's badass. Like he gets it. And it's like some, maybe it's this. And, you know, and there's a shared connection of an experience there that we wouldn't have seen in each other otherwise, you know, because we have different worlds that we're part of and all the varying boundaries and barriers between things that just happen by like our human design, you know. Um, anything else? Question? No, it, I, I tend to uh, I tend to think that beauty because it's so kind of impractical. <laughs> if that makes sense, like it's not practical to spend months painting a painting, or to, uh, you know, it is a highly it. impractical job. <laughs> <laughs> or spending you know weeks to get the right shot or whatever. Um, but it it helps us in our lives. You know, beauty can make pain bearable, it, it has a really interesting function. Um, Andrew, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you transmit story through your art, and I don't know if you can fit in there a little bit about the unique medium of digital, you know, because you're kind of an explorer there too. Thanks, Evan. Um, you know, when I think, when I think about um, what story means and how story, how I interact with story and my art, I think it, there's probably I could break it into three different categories. And uh, the first, kind of like the meta-ness of it, would just be the, there's a story that comes through in the process of a piece. Um, for me, the, uh, the, really, the real driving factor behind the art that I make is the creative experience itself. Just this whole, the agony and the ecstasy and the discovery and the success and the failure, but this whole, the, the arc and the journey from starting with, you know, and, and the opportunity for an infinite amount of directions and exploring that to getting to one finite end, just that whole process is what drives me. And the art that's, that's left behind, the art that gets created with that is really just the residue of that journey that I'm going on. And so there's, there's one element of the story that has to do with the process, and that's what's going on in my life at the time, like what were the factors, uh, where was I when I was making this piece? What was, what was I listening to? What were the set and the settings? Like all of that, there's a there's a rich story that happens within there. Um, then there's a story that I would say evolves more around. It's there's the the uh, the evolution of a piece. Um, and when I'm making it, often when I start off with pieces, sometimes I'll think about wanting to go for an emotion, but a lot of the times. It's just, it's, I just try to really just come up against this me and my subconscious. Um, within the tools and the digital tools that I use now, 
within these digital tools, and I use tablets and monitors, and these, this monitor, once I can really be present with it, it becomes almost just like a, a window into another world that's a reflection of my imagination. That's kind of the, it's a, that's the, like the mental context that I'm in when I'm creating a piece. And a lot of times, I'll really just start off with, with chaos and shapes and just total subjectivity, nothing objective at all. And a piece evolves as I throw down these, these chaos and these shapes and colors. There's a point where the chaos becomes so uncomfortable that the, the meaning-making machine of my mind starts to make something objective. And there's this back and forth of a, it's kind of exploring a conversation in the first level of the conversation, usually like my own fears, like this isn't, good enough, or you're doing the same thing you did before, like all the little the little voices that are there, but I've been making art for so long that it's just, I just know those are background noises. Sometimes they'll get to me because it's my ego evolves with me and gets more cunning and <laughs> brings me lower and, de and lower and lower all the time. Like I'm, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing foe. Um, but once I can kind of get past that, then the, the piece starts to evolve and um, ideally, if I stick with it and I trust the process, there's a place where the conversation is almost more of a, a, a subconscious and kind of an unconscious where things are starting to be revealed to me through the painting. And the act of creation gives birth to new ideas that I never would have thought unless I got to, you know, there's, there's things that are revealed, that are only revealed 15 hours into a painting or 30 hours into a painting. Something else is kind of revealed and you get over under level so the piece is kind of evolves back and forth and it's finished either when I'm just like I just don't have any more fight in me I'm like tired of fighting it or I get excited to like pick another fight with another thing you know because it's always those first blows are so much fun um, and uh, or it just gets to a point where it's just like this is what this painting needs to communicate sometimes I don't even know what it means at the end it's just like but it felt like that battle was worth sharing and showing other people that. And then the third element, so there's the process, there's the, the evolution of the story, and then what I really find valuable is what story it then evokes with other people. Because often the paintings that I'm making, they're just like half of this combination. You know, they're just this, they, they're, they're, a, they're kind of a prima material, and like a catalyst, but the real magic always takes place within uh, someone else and their experience and them viewing the painting. So often I try not to be, I try to be, or try not to be very heavy handed with like, this is what this painting's about. Like I have a hard time even naming some paintings because I don't want that name to influence someone's experience because often the paintings and the reason I, I, I go to the effort to make these galleries at Burning Man to introduce all these people to art when their subconsciouses are very open and vulnerable and uh, is that I feel that the, there's something really valuable about the mirror that a painting can be. And, you know, I think one of the reasons that, you know, Eben made this, uh, he was talking about how he gets more out of a single image than he does watching like a whole film with all these images. And, you know, the reason I, my theory behind that is because Eben brings so much to that image, you know. There's so much depth and and richness, and there's you know, Eben's brilliant mind, and it's it's Eben's capacity to understand something that makes the story come alive. Because there's enough there that he can journey into that. A, a film doesn't do that. A film just beats you over the head the entire time. Like begin, you know, there's a structure and there's a moral, or there's this. Most films. But an image, it gives someone the ability to, in a very nonverbal way, to interact with these shapes and archetypes and colors and forms. And it's, I really find that, it's, that, that, that a painting can be, and the story can be, as, as developed or as successful as the, as the frame and the state of mind and the consciousness that someone brings to the painting when they see it. Andrew, could you share a little bit more about me being smart? <laughs> that was that was awesome. <sighs> I have to, have to calm down after that. So we've got a uh, we've got a treat here. 
Um, these artists are going to, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little show and tell, right? So we're gonna walk through maybe five images um, from each of them. And we're gonna do maybe 20 or 30 seconds each with a few. And then um, each of them has selected one image that they'd like to you know, really tell you the story of that piece, okay? Sean, could you maybe knock out the sunlight? Okay, thank you, perfect. <laughs> All right, so we already saw this one from Hans. Hearts, colors. Um, there's, a, there's a great uh, print of this out in the gallery um, you might want to go see. I can talk about this if you want. Go. Uh, being as it's one of your favorite pieces. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, this, this piece is uh, really about just like listening to your heart above anything else and how it can really help let the mind chatter, just fly and, and release. And the only real colors in this piece are the, the tears that are coming from her eyes, which um, you can see her falling and stopping, or basically cutting through this clock pattern uh, that you see kind of revolving around from her face and how just listening to your heart and like those tears can stop all time and space. And um, yeah, that's, that's about the, the, the quick and dirty of that. This piece is called Genesis. Uh, it's a piece that can, has no right side up. It can be flipped upside down. It can be flipped sideways. And it's just speaking to uh, the duality of consciousness and human existence and how they exist at the same time at all times. And um, a lot of my background in architecture helps inform the composition with uh, very heavily based uh, geometry compositions that tell this that help tell the story and um, just about the human existence reflecting upon the consciousness or the conscious existence and that never ending cycle and uh, the whole piece is based off of splitting of two circles in the vesica Pisces um, and just the beginning of how the beginning of creation basically and the division between light and dark piercing all third eyes of every face on the piece. Um, and how she sees this hummingbird that can see through to the other uh, level of existence or plane of existence, if you will. And, uh, this one is called Listen to the Rhythm. And um, a lot of, again, you see that kind of geometry is informing the story. A lot of my pieces have story and message to them. Uh, this one has, has a circle that continues from her heart and is feeding, is basically um, turning into the flowers that the hummingbird is then eating from and then coming back through the third eye and this whole cycle and revolution um, that's happening. And yeah, in the background you see the um, cross that basically represents the cross of nature and four uh, seasons and um, yeah, just listening to the rhythm of nature. Uh, this piece is called Epiphany. And it's a commission that I did for Evan. And it's just basically um, talking about kind of finding your purpose in life and uh, yeah, just following that. Uh, this piece is called Stepping into the Light. And it's uh, another piece based off of Esca Pisces flipped upside down. And um, basically the point of that starting at the heart center, coming up through the third eye of each woman and then back to a moon. And uh, the moon is basically in center with uh, a flower called Princess of the Night. It's a cactus flower that only blooms on a full moon. And the story of uh, just a day and night dream and awake states. And what's the difference between your dreams and your awake state? And your perception becomes your reality. And as this hummingbird with a heart in the center being the messenger between the dream and the awake state. Um, do you want me to talk, talk, talk about, about this one? one? Yeah. Okay, so I'll go into a little more detail with this piece. Uh, this piece is called Cielo Cielo, Sky Sky, and it was uh, inspired actually by a, a medicine ceremony that I had uh, with ayahuasca, and it's uh, a particular vine uh, or that um, the lineage of ayahuasca, I should say, or, or variety that grows along the jungle floor in the deepest, darkest parts of the jungle and basically finds its way to a tree where it will wind itself up the tree and, and up the branches and out the top of the canopy up to the sky. And so uh, it goes from the darkest part of the jungle into basically the most bright sunlight. And so you see the division, um, that strong division in this piece between light and dark. 
and um, so much growth happens in that darkness and, and, you know, in your heart and in your life. And a lot of my pieces kind of reflect on this uh, dark and light duality and, and, you know, how one wouldn't exist without the other and how you learn so much from the darkness. And so in this piece, uh, she has this lion that's pumping out of her heart and it's just this kind of release of uh, everything that the darkness has, you know, taught her and the just the juxtaposition of, of the hummingbird that's coming out and between the strength of a lion and agility of a hummingbird. And if you draw a line from the heart through the third eye of the uh, lion and through the hummingbird into the sun, uh, there's a direct line and path there that is just this fearlessness. Um, and also hiding geometries within here using you know Fibonacci numbers and golden mean ratio just as a hidden piece in it to organize the composition of the piece. and. You kind of see that starting from her hair coming out and up through the bottom, like underneath the lion's mouth and then back through the hummingbird and to the third eye of the lion. And it just helps organize the, the subjects of the piece for me. And I think creates a really nice harmony in the composition when people look at it. And a lot of the times I use that just to subconsciously uh, create compositions that are pleasing to the eye. And, um, you know, Da Vinci, a lot of people did this. This isn't anything new. Uh, it's just something that I find uh, inspiring. And um, yeah, pieces that, the pieces that I do, I really try and just evoke a, a sense of remembrance of our strength and our relationship to nature and earth and um, really just trying to have this remembrance and this like remembrance of uprising and union between each other and the masses and and the strength within the feminine that's rising right now uh, so heavily and a lot of the women that I that I portray have this kind of look of this dristy look if any of you ever do yoga it's this uh, centering effect that is just this concentration and this strength and quietness that I think everybody holds within them and I really try and find photography and inspiration that really captures this mood and this strength and this energy and this um, a lot of pieces have this connection to heart heart centered pieces where I feel like we all really need to listen to our hearts to find that strength um, and I think that's about it for this this piece yeah if you get a chance um, go out to the uh, art container because there's a great print of this piece right uh, by the door and when you can really see what the the print looks like you get a I don't know, the sense of the luminosity and the radiance of it. It's yep. really, really beautiful. I guess last thing I'll say about this piece, you'll see a lot of patterns in my pieces with stripes and striations, and, and it just, to me, represents uh, when you look at like sedimentary layers of rocks over time and life experiences and how you can tell the history of what happened during that time. And to me, that's what, um, or tr lifelines in a tree when you cut it open, like that's what these stripe patterns that you'll see repeated through a lot of my pieces represent. All right. Thanks, Hans. Zipporah. Hello. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Forgot. I just snuck this one in there. Um, we just well, took this literally me. an hour ago or something. If you go up to uh, the house known as Red Door, which is just down the... St that way. Right. That way. <laughs> the other that way. Yeah. Go out to the road and go down the road that way. Um, two driveways on the left. You'll see that on the garage door of the house. Um, Hans is just finishing it up. Oh, yeah, on the art studio at the house, right. And, um, yeah, just go see it. It's really great. It's a really special piece. He just painted it over this last week. Five minutes. So let's talk about some of your, your art. Okay. Um. So this was taken at the temple at, I believe, Burning Man 2014. And um, Burning Man presents a, a tricky challenge for me because um, I actually photograph as part of their official doc team and especially representing the, the event, I have to, I'm supposed to ask permission. And what I was just explaining before is, is very difficult because I, I, it's this tricky thing to interrupt um, and when there's a moment that invites me to honor it, um, I've had to find a really graceful way of, of feeling into that permission. <laughs> and I did manage to catch his eye 
and he he gave me the nod that it was okay and then he just let me he really just he didn't shift anything and she wasn't aware but he'd given me permission so um, I'm really I'm in love with both the children and the elders they are the bookends um, they are I want to bring them more in so this is my honoring um, this is a, a good little triptych I just threw together that shows gives you kind of a good sense of the the sort of moments that draw my attention um, the one on the far left was a moment at Envision Festival. I can't remember which year, and also the one on the far right. Um, I think both of those were moments during Random Rab sunrise sets, which have come to be... Uh, Random Rab is a, a producer, music producer, who makes really beautiful music, that his sets are sort of these, like, church for this culture. Um, and I, I, they are very rich with these sorts of moments for me. And the one in the middle is at a festival called Beloved in Oregon. And um, I think it's definitely one of my favorite photos that I've created thus far in my career. Um, so this image uh, is really touches me. There's so much in this one, I, and I will avoid going too deep into it, but the little girl in this image, this was at Burning Man this year, or just last year, 2015, and it was Sunday uh, at the temple again, and I had photographed this little girl at Burning Man 2014, and she has quite a fascinating story. She's got several parents, and uh, they've really socialized her in an incredible way. You see she's got like, pink and blue hair, um, she's just a, she touches people. You can see people are almost brought to tears when they encounter this little girl, and she has quite a presence. So it's a beautiful moment. These people had just met her. And this is a little girl that I had a very playful, momentary connection with in a place called Gokarna in India. And she really, really wanted to engage with with me and the camera and that extension of me. And this image is uh, one of my favorite. Also, just for the her her luminous eyes, they tell me so much. But also this playful little pursed lips. Um, there's so much. You could, I feel like she's she's telling me so much, and I'm so curious about who she is and and who she will grow to be. So um, I chose to end on this one. This is also at the temple uh, at Burning Man, 2014. And this, again, I'm going to go back to the, the this notion of being invited. Um, and for me, part of honing my craft is, is to really develop a, um, a sensitivity to those invitations and to those moments that are inviting me. Again, for me, it's really about trying to remove myself from the equation as much as I can. And um, as the last image might have indicated, I spent a fair amount of time in India. I actually spent almost 20, all of 2010 there. And in India, the, the locals are so overly sensitized to cameras that, that it, it forced me to really go into this place of, of um, discernment and to be really clear in my, the energy that I'm bringing to those moments um, with the camera as, as an extension of myself. And I've, I've shifted my terminology, which some of you, I've, I, I've been gently trying to convey and like offer a shift in the terminology, the way we, we talk about photography. We've been given words to describe it, um, take, capture, and they, they hold a certain energy that for me, I don't feel fits what I'm doing now. And a lot of that came from that year in India. So there are moments like this that I feel such a strong invitation to honor. I, I prefer the word honor. I honor moments rather than capture them. And again, this this um, not supposed to take a photo unless I ask was it's very it was a very difficult moment, and I I really checked in, and something just told me it was okay. So I really didn't want to interrupt. This man was having such a beautiful moment. Uh, I don't know what his story was. I don't know what it was about, but something there asked me really to show up with my camera. So I. I took two photos, and this is, this is one of them, and I just quietly put my card in his hat and moved on my way and hoped that all would be well. And he called me about a week after Burning Man, after I returned home from Burning Man, and he was 
giddy and just so grateful. He said he'd found the, the card in his hat and he'd gone to my website and perused my work and I've got a, pr a fairly extensive body of work and he said, I really hope that finding your card meant that you photographed me because if there was one moment in that entire burn that I would have wanted a record of, it was that moment. And it was such a beautiful, uh, a beautiful reflection back to me that um, I really am here for something that is not about me. And to go beyond those structures that, it, that I've been asked to work within that are from some paradigm that, that, that my craft doesn't fit within, um, just confirmation that I'm, as long as I honor that, then I will be doing just that. I will be honoring moments rather than capturing and taking them for me. So. Thank you. Michael, let's talk about a few of your images here. Yeah, it's interesting giving sound bites to things, you know, that are like months at a time. And as Andrew pointed out, they're like boxing matches and safaris and meditations all together. So uh, this is called Birth of a Star. And, you know, sometimes uh, an idea just kind of comes to me. And I was driving through New Mexico, I think, and was reflecting on a experience from a Vipassana meditation where at the end it was just all this sort of flickering blue flames all around me that were just so warm. And I was like, I wonder what that would be like to paint that and explore that idea. Because it's sort of just giving space usually to those kind of things. And, and that's what I made. Uh, limits, I painted, I think I was 24. And it was like 2001. Anyway, limits, you know, when you're like 24, it's limitless. There's no limits to anything. So there's often a pushing of edges and stuff. And that feeling between the, the sort of base emptiness nothing that we could imagine and that farthest edge in ourselves where we sort of dissolve until the, the edge we come back to. That's the, the I am part or the part that says I get it. And, you know, that's where, that's our limit. That's our furthest edge, I think, until we dissolve again and we come back and I get it again, you know, and so on. Uh, Samsara, this is a painting I just painted this past summer. And it was interesting because my, my wife just finished her PhD this past fall and she was working on a dissertation through the summer. I don't know if you've either written a dissertation or been with someone writing a dissertation. And it's like... You don't want to be anywhere near that. It's kind of like Frodo in the <laughs> ring. You remember Frodo and he's like going up the mountain and it's like, you're watching, just watching this. And it's like, fuck. And I was like, you know, sitting and it's hot. It's like boiling the Southern California summer. And I was like, this is it. This is the wheel, life and death. And it's just, <laughs> it just goes on. And anyway, it's samsara, you know, that's samsara. <laughs> uh, the Glass Onion, I had, I had wanted to paint a painting that was um, just a sort of cathedral mental space and the, the just worlds passing through. And as I was working on it and getting through these layers of it and imagining these layers I'm getting through, I, I ran across a, an interview of John Lennon and Rolling Stone. It was like, you know, one of his last interviews or something. And the, the interviewer was asking him about where his work comes from and you know what inspires it and he was like well i'm i'm always trying to dig through all of the the reasons to make something you know like like whether it's for fame or or self aggrandizement or you know just all the reasons to do stuff and and the interviewer is like oh like looking through the glass onion and i thought oh yeah the glass onion that's a good title because there's you know no onion and like that's it so this painting um was commissioned by Eben and Annie over here. And uh, last year, a little while back, and you know, we're, my wife and I were, were going through some difficult times and they were like, we want a painting of true love. And I was like, I can do that. But you know, love was like, you know, it wasn't last, it was, it was a little bit ago. Anyway, uh, love to really paint that is like, you can't fake it. 
So when it really came to like that November, really sitting down with it on my easel, and it's like this giant blank canvas, and I'm like, love, right? Um, so but you it's think, sort of this think, progression, uh, you know? six feet tall. Yeah, so it's two meters tall, and it's kind of daunting at that point. And I'm like, I'm gonna make this top where it's these two jewels communicating, and we were not two jewels communicating. So. I actually put it through a progression of, of slides so that we could look at the different parts. Because a lot of my paintings, they have like these different parts. And, and this is one of the more sort of linear almost, you know? So there's like two people and you meet and you're in this space and it's sort of like crystally and it's, it's great. It's really, sparks are flying, you know? But it's pretty tight space still. And then you come out of that. And in the next one, there is sort of this growth thing that happens where you're either like kind of faces on the side, the, this kind of tension that develops as we get to know people. And, and these paths, I think, go through our lives quite often in life and in intimate relationships where it's like it pushes apart and we have to find like the, the place where we come together again. We keep growing. And um, in the next one, there's this like flower sort of space developing and this new sort of beings in there, this sort of like... Um, where we meet each other again, we meet as equals, you know, there's not like a higher or a lower and there's not the tension between people. And, you know, the, the going through this while working on my own relationship was, a, was, is that story, is that story we were talking about, about process, you know, and I mean, truth be told, right here in this painting, I'm not going to talk about it. Nope, truth be told, it's another story for another time. Um, and then towards the top, you know, there's these two great jewels kind of just communicating, like light comes in and, you know, we pretty much are taking all this light and we're separating it into this spectrum and experiencing things and we're speaking it back out and there's a cycle that can happen between people, you know, where we're really communicating. And in those moments when we're really like truly in love with someone and we're there and we're in that dance, it's just those like, two massive jewels in space and you're not colliding but you're just like passing by and sharing and and that was that that experience and it was called the crucible because you know love is this like crucible within which with when which something new comes out of it something new is formed you know we can melt everything down and keep growing and building in that thanks michael Yeah, this is the uh, the rainbow geisha image. Um, uh, when I made this, I remember I kind of started working on this, and it was right when the uh, the Fukushima earthquakes had happened. It was this really interesting time where I just finished this piece, and I was I was actually in Sydney at the time, and I as I did this piece, I did a time lapse, and I was working with this studio called Obscura, and they wanted a uh, they wanted a piece of art because we were actually in, I think we were in Australia and the Fukushima earthquake had just happened and they wanted a uh, like kind of like a response to that in a way, like some type of like visual gesture. And we were doing this project, we were projecting onto the Sydney Opera House and I happened to have this painting and a time-lapse version of it that really fit well in the ratio of the, of the architecture of the Opera House and so we ended up going with this image and showing this like live projection of it being created and then it became this real focal point. So up to this point, this is probably the image that was seen by the most amount of people. This one is called uh, Love is a Riot. And um, um, I have a, like a, a certain category of, thanks guys, uh, pieces that are pseudo um, political. They're almost more just reactionary. Um, I, I love watching history unfold. Um, I think we're, it's a, such an unbelievably amazing time to be alive and to witness all of these like social upheavals and changes um, in society. And this was when the uh, the riots were going on in Turkey. And um, I sometimes when these things are happening, I get like really glued to these like live feeds, and I start to start watching like the movement of people and 
a lot of times when you have these like these drone shots or these overhead shots, you almost start seeing kind of like the fractal nature and, and the patterns and the micro, the macro and the micro of all these, like this momentum of all these people moving. And as I saw, there's, um, with, in, with this particular kind of like historical aspect, there was a lot of red that was used with, uh, that was like the unifying color of all the rioters and all the police had these like, the, the, the police in Turkey had these really white helmets and there was a really stark contrast between them. And I just was just really obsessed with all these overhead shots of these two groups like clashing in this friction point in the middle, which they were meeting. And uh, I guess the idea about this piece, it was um, from kind of a, uh, I don't know, like an integral Ken Wilber, like beyond the where light bifurcates into, into dark and light. There's this where even, even though this is an interaction of like violence and and frustration and anger and tyranny and lack of freedom. There's these, these humans are coming together. They're still within, like, behind the veil of every, all of our interactions. It's just the need for love and more love. And a lot of times when we're acting out, it's because we're just not able to communicate our love or not get enough love. And even when you see these two forces rioting, there's really an element of it's just groups of human beings trying to love each other. And this somehow this is the most technological way they can figure out at the time that fulfills all those things within the social political context. So, and love is crazy and love is a riot. So that's the name of this piece. Um, this piece was called, this is called Cosmic Kiss. And I'm trying to think what the, there was, I think this is when I had first, I had, I had just met my, um, my first wife, Phaedra, at the time, and I was trying to encapsulate that moment when two people meet and they fall in love, and within, it's kind of the, I, I wanted to encapsulate that, that, uh, that quantum occurrence when two really, two people that are, that have some type of, of fate intertwined meet for the first time and kiss for the first time, and within that nexus point, as they're exchanging electricity and energy and saliva, just like the quantum explosion of possibilities that happens in both of their imaginations and resets this whole template that's going to change the rest of both of their destinies. And so I, that's what this piece was about. I just got to show, because sometimes you can't see it, especially small like this. Um, imagine, okay, so forehead, nose, mouth, that's a head, shoulder, arm, hand around, that's the man. And then here's the woman here, this is her head, and this is her arm and her shoulder and her back. You seeing it? That'll help it make sense. I don't know, I also have a, we talk about this subjective nature and people bring their own experience to it, but I, I have a, I, I sell editions of shameless plug and these pieces off my website and I had a guy that bought like a massive like maybe like an eight or ten foot version of this and uh well and then another guy actually with <laughs> that also has amazing taste uh bought this piece and we have an eight or ten footer of that in our living room he, actually. Uh, yeah, almost. No, no, no. No, but, but he calls this, this is like his, this, he calls it like the, the, he loves this piece so much like he loves the, the Japan, Japanese samurai on the horse. And I have no idea what the heck he's talking about. It's so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a total choose your own adventure on that one. Uh, uh, this piece, I'm noticing a theme with all these. I, I do do paintings of things that are not two people effigies making out, <laughs> believe it or not. But they are really successful, so they do, they do keep the lights on on the farm. Um, this piece is called Embrace, and this was made at Burning Man in 2014. I think that's when this happened. And it was a Friday morning, and I, had, I was really proud of myself. I'd made this. Burning Man's really cool because you can make these things called art cars, which you sacrifice a fully functional vehicle and you destroy like all other purpose other than it having some sort of like flashy signaling or spitting fire or doing in my case this I made this do it's a dune buggy that had a projector on it but it had a little Honda generator and the goal was that I could make art wherever I wanted to instead of schlepping my stuff all around the playa that I'd done for a decade 
So I had this really cool art car, and I had, there's this huge effigy called Embrace, and these are two figures that are, I mean, if I said 50 feet high, would that be exaggerating? Anybody that was there? That sounds pretty close. Like 75 feet tall, like huge, huge. These huge wooden effigies of these two figures. And this Friday morning was the morning that they were going to burn it, which is really rare, too. Most of the burns happen at night. So this is just a really unique time and place. And it was going to happen at sunrise at around 6. And I stayed up all night. And I got out there with my car. And I was there with just one of my friends. And like a lot of things in Burning Man, it was just delayed. And it wasn't on time. And I was kind of there. And I had a really good spot. But I didn't want to leave. And I didn't, you know, I was kind of bored. And I was like, oh, I've totally got my computer and my Wacom. I should just totally make a painting of this thing right now. And so I just started making a painting. Because the, the, the environment was so charged. You had you know, maybe eight or 9,000 people all this, 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 this um, kind of this this anxiety and excitement that was just building. Everyone was just waiting to see this, this beautiful piece of art that was the end result of just thousands of people's hours of life and time and tons of trees and timber waiting for this moment for when it started and when they were going to set this on fire. And they finally did. And it was, it was just a very, it was very exhilarating. Everyone there knew that they were seeing something that was very special that would never happen again and it was such a catharsis to watch these two figures like these two this 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 figure this couple burn in front of you was so surreal and so yeah this painting was kind of my little uh, uh just a way of capturing the this this really i felt this really valuable potent moment in a way that i could capture it that you know, isn't a camera or wasn't a video or wasn't just a story. And so that's why I painted this one. And the piece was called Embrace. And this is, uh, this one is called Union. And uh, this is, uh, I, I tell my girlfriend, I'm really glad I'm not like a musician because if I was, this would be my free bird and I'd have to like sing this painting over and over and over for like for the rest of my life. So, so stoked that I chose the art path because I just hit a button and I just print it out. But this is definitely like the free bird of all my images. And it was a commissioned as a wedding piece between this two, this beautiful couple on the left, uh, which are Brian Franklin and Jennifer Russell. And I had not known them, but they had known of my art. And when they were getting married, they invited, they, no, they didn't invite me, they commissioned me and they, they paid me money to go to their wedding. And make a painting of them. And I'd never really done, I'd done portraits before. I've never, this is the first couple painting that I had done before. And uh, I was a little suspicious at first, but I got, I started talking to them more and all of their, they had all of their friends like send me these huge, like several paragraph like descriptions of who Brian and Jennifer are and what they represent. And they were like really into their story, their particular story. And we had like phone conferences, and I was on this one phone conference where they were, it was our first time meeting on the phone, and they were just probably went off for like an hour about what this means and what their relationship was. And it was at a time when I was really exhausted, and I like, I fell asleep during like the whole <laughs> phone conference. And like Phaedra, like, just kind of kept the conversation going and like woke me up afterwards. And so I had no idea what they told me to, to do whatsoever. <laughs> But I went to their, their, their ceremony, and it was, it was so beautiful. It was the most beautiful public love ritual I had ever seen before. And Annie and Eben were actually part of it. They were characters in this, 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 this huge bit of uh, public signaling and commitment. And I was just so touched. That I'd, I'd really, I don't think I'd ever seen two people that made s such a powerful commitment to their entire tribe in front of everyone in this public way. And it really made me realize, oh, this is, this is what marriage is about. You know, it's not just this formality. It's not just this thing that we do automatically. Like it was, yeah, it was really moving. And I wanted to try to convey that. And I think that one of the reasons this image is really successful is that their love was so um, so authentic and uh, and so genuine, and this is just one of those pieces that just it just hits this strange sort of like archetypal balance. Like I know it's just like colors and shapes and things, but the amount of people that are able to that I've met 
that are able to see themselves in this painting um, is really remarkable. I mean, I have people that accuse me of, of going onto their Facebook and copying photos of them. They think, it's, they think it looks so much like them that they're that convinced. And, uh, but yeah, I love this piece because it makes a lot of love. You know, people that have this and they put it on their wall and it becomes this, uh, this, it's this little alchemical, magical, two-dimensional um, rectangle that when they see it, it evokes a, a higher ideal of how they can show up in their relationship or with their partner. And um, yeah, it just, it's just, there's, there's, there's a marginally, uh, maybe even measurable, larger amount of love in the world because this piece exists than before this piece existed. And so that's pretty cool. <laughs>